Howdy hackers and welcome to another episode of Fairlight TV. This one we fought harder for than most of the others we've done so far. It's been too little Amiga material on the channel and we are trying to make up for that. So this time we would have Photon of Scopex showing you 10 of his favorite demos on OCS. So traditional original chipset demos. Over to Photon. So hello everybody and welcome to Fairlight TV. This is an episode that we fought really hard to actually make happen. Uh, first of all, uh, I've been to blame for having too little Amiga material and uh, I have been scouting around for somebody who could help me share knowledge, experience and, and also views on the Amiga scene. So today we have Photon of Scopex, Henrik Erlansson. Welcome Hal Henrik, how are you? Thank you Bacchus, uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, nice to meet you by the way. Uh, did you have a good time in at Fjell, Fjelldata? Yes, so we should say that as well, that uh, this was scheduled for within like two hours ago, but I just came home from Fjelldata yesterday and after work I just crashed in the sofa. So I had Henrik hanging on this Zoom call for a few hours. <laughs> My oh. humble apologies for that. I hope we can make up with it. No problem at all. Okay, so uh, Henrik, um, we should have a special episode of you and your stuff that you have been doing for, for Scoopix and also the, the time you had with Phenomena before that, but uh, you joined Scoopix in 1991, which makes you one of those who is really dedicated for, for participating in one group, uh, not jumping around like a number of others are doing. So. Uh, Tell us briefly about your like life in Scoopix. What do you do in Scoopix? Uh, I'm a coder and organizer. Uh, I've uh, helped uh, organize the website for our group. Um, and in general, try to find time to produce for the group, as well as help uh, my members uh, produce something. So often uh, the releases from Scoopix um, are occasioned by some special event like um, uh, game crack, uh, um, a, a cooperation with somebody, mm -hmm. maybe not in Scoopix, maybe outside Scoopix, or something like that. For me, it's like that. Uh, with, uh, sometimes, obviously, there's uh, demo parties, so then the pressure is always on mm -hmm. to find time to release something decent, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so I've competed in a few demo parties, so have uh, other members of my group. Um, and in general, we're having a chill time in Scoopix right now. Uh, many of us are busy with, with our lives and so on and so forth uh, because of the age we are. Uh, mm. we, we have careers and we have families and uh, there are priorities, obviously. Great. Yeah. So we, for sure, yeah. for sure. But you were also one of those really keen on sharing your knowledge. Uh, your coppershade.org is sharing a number of... Um, it's very, very comprehensive sh access to uh, um, like programming uh, Amiga assembler. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it's been a, a long project. Uh, it's basically my... Uh, I wouldn't say private website, but it's an initiative just to get access to correct code and correct refer references. And for example, I have noticed people coming back to Amiga and having a problem, you know, finding mm. a screen to connect to their Amiga. Mm. And once they find a screen, how do I program it? How do mm. I set it up so that it's uh, visible on flat screens and CRTs and, and all that stuff? Um, yeah, it's a great reference. I've I've heard a number of people referencing uh, people coding Amiga that they are reading every little letter on that site. So <laughs> uh, we will have a link down below just to ensure that you get it. So if you didn't catch it, it's coppershade.org, but uh, there will be a link below. So uh, so Henrik, the the idea here is that we should 
have you as like a video jockey and you will do 10 OCS demos and then we will have a later session sometimes when we feel it's it's good time to have a second one where we'll go down to to watch a number of Aga demos instead. So so this is the OCS Henrik's 10 best OCS demos. Hi. So and and also give let's give us uh, some sort of flavor. What kind of demos are you like? Are you liking? Uh, is it the music or the code or the graphics that triggers you, or the perfect balance? And how is the perfect balance? Uh, well, I had some trouble uh, picking out only ten OCS demos out of probably twenty five thousand published. Uh, how do you select? How do you narrow it down? so severely. So I decided that I shouldn't go by technical prowess. I shouldn't go by graphics or music, excellent graphics or music. I should just pick the ones that mean the most to me. Yeah, that's uh, a very good choice. The ones that for some reason uh, impressed me more than others when I saw them the first time. Okay, great. Uh, we're now on the section where Henrik is showing the videos. And the first one is 1988 AD by Thorax. And uh, we're not really sure where they are from or uh, or or that. But uh, our guess is that, that this is a German group. It's really early. So Henrik, uh, do tell us, what do we see? What, is, what will eventually turn up on the screen and all of that? Uh, well, uh, this is uh, one of the first demos that affected me greatly, and that's uh, how I have selected only 10 demos from all the 25,000 OCS demos uh, that have been uh, released. Um, uh, Thorax uh, is a mystery. Uh, it seemed they released only a handful of productions on Amiga, and uh, I've done some research. Uh, I do research when I, it's one of my favorite pastimes. Uh, if a demo interests me, I follow it up and you can go to uh, Janeway, um, uh, which is a preservation site. Uh, and uh, you can see links and you can see where members went and so on and so forth. So uh, I can't recall right now what happened to the group. Um, uh, whether they were hit by work life uh, or family or military service and had to leave the Amiga uh, for that reason, or if they went to another platform or they each joined uh, new groups. Right. So I, I find here on, on Janeway that MIG and Wearmaster were both from Germany. So I guess you can say the group was actually a German. It's uh, very difficult to say because uh, even, even uh, among the older groups, there were often members from many countries, obviously. Yeah, shoot. So hit us with it. Uh, so what we see is uh, a star field, a logo, and uh, a sort of a perspective ground effect and a scroller. Uh, without going too t deep, deeply technically into the demo, uh, um, the thing that affected me with this demo was the music. Earlier demos had had uh, like uh, sample loops and uh, um, soundtrack music using uh, sampled instruments that came with Soundtracker, so they tended to sound relatively similar. Uh, but I liked this song a lot when I was young, and it told me in some ways that you can. Um, even though the song likely has plenty of ST01 uh, samples in it, it told me, for some reason, <laughs> uh, that you could do things on Amiga with sound that you couldn't do on other computers. It, uh, and ST01 is when you have your sound tracker, that is sort of the default set of samples you get on the first disc, right? Uh, yes, I think there were two discs, ST01 and ST02. Uh, that came with the first version of Soundtracker. I'm not 100% on that, but uh, uh, later, of course, there would be over 100, I think, uh, and even duplicates, so that the two numbers, uh, 0, 01 to 99, wasn't enough, so that, uh, let's say, ST65 could exist in as two separate sample discs with totally different samples on them. 
Yeah, makes sense. So, and then we should say that uh, we are running this from YouTube. So if you find that uh, the scrolls aren't 100% smooth and all of that, that's just our the way we are recording this. So don't blame Thorax for uh, having uh, unsmooth scrolls. They, they, they are actually fully, uh, fully nicely smooth in the original. Yes, uh, this demo runs full frame rate. Uh... Uh, I've selected the demos, as I said, from how they affected me, and since I was very young here, uh, I could obviously try to analyze the technical side of it, And but nowadays, of course, I can see more clearly what is going on. Mm -hmm. So the star field, for example, you can see some stars moving very slowly and some just flying out of the screen, even though they should be within the same star field, so mm -hmm. it's not the traditional uh, 3D projection star field. And then you have a perspective picture probably drawn in Deluxe Paint using all 31 colors and then color cycling through it to give the perspective effect. And a scroller with animated characters. Great. Uh, I must say that the, the, the logo is not the best logo I've seen, but uh, <laughs> I, I do acknowledge that the music was very nice, though. All right. So next up is a music disc. Uh, so I talked about music for the previous demo and uh, Dr. Omar Buse Orgasm Crackings was another German group uh, who released uh, many versions of their own sound tracker. So there is a heredity tree for trackers on Amiga. Uh, the original was the ultimate uh, sound tracker. That was actually the, the uh, ac very first sound tracker used by Karsten Um And from that, once that was um, copied and spread and modified and made to um, um, play songs and demos better and more efficiently, so the, this uh, heredity tree grew to noise tracker and pro tracker and all the rest. What was their name? Did they call theirs Sound Tracker or, or did they have a, a different name for them? Uh, they called it uh, the DOC Sound Tracker. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, because yeah. I had a chat with, with Mahoney on, uh, and Noise Tracker was, of course, mentioned. So there will be an episode on, on Mahoney. Possibly you've already seen this when, when you are watching this one. So, All right. Um, so I think they released in all maybe 12 versions of their sound tracker mm. and there was no fear of uh, incompatibility you either had uh, the latest version of every sound tracker or you were a lamer you had to <laughs> <laughs> absolutely have uh, have uh, uh, you had to be in with the latest news and oh, yeah. know, keep know, current know which, uh, keep current and know which version to use and they all Great. competed with different features Great, so let's have a look at this one. So here we have kind of a classic uh, DOC logo. They liked very big logos. <laughs> um, and it contains a fill color that is shaded by the copper. Mm -hmm. And uh, below it, you see um, a wireframe 3D uh, mesh moving with the music, synced with the music. Now, when you record for YouTube, you might not get exact sync, uh, mm -hmm. but the grid is supposed to be uh, a grid of, uh, I suppose, 16 or 31 instruments. Um, attached to grid coordinates and when they each instrument is triggered uh, you get a peak that slowly falls down to come flat i mean it's it's just a way to present the music like uh, rather than the standard bars that go up and down you do it more mathematically i guess yeah. And then you also have a shadow underneath it, so I guess they're showing... Are they showing the same bit plane twice, or how is that done? Uh, yes, uh, so uh, the same bit plane pointer is put into two bit planes, and mm -hmm. one bit plane is offset vertically and horizontally a little bit. Uh, so obviously this is not a 
super technically impressive demo apart from this equalizer or visualizer uh, grid uh, vector net but it is real time and if this were a demo you could move your mouse and uh, this grid would then move around on the screen and you could zoom in and zoom out uh, so I've re uh, I think did I record this I think two songs are recorded anyway Here's a slower song, unless it's... Um, the first song is sort of a medley um, that we heard with many interesting sort of metal parts. Uh, and this is this is still the first song, I think, yeah. So it should start over soon and then we'll hear the start of the next song and then we can move on. But that, that like electric guitar or whatever it is, it's uh, that's also very for me very early Amiga stuff. That's yeah, yeah. A lot of the things were like that. You also had some strums uh, that were sampled that you could use uh, to great effect to mix up the 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 uh, metal guitar. So let's see if this is still the same song. I think it is. So this song is four and a half minutes long and it's a medley of basically several songs in different tempo. So it's very varied and here you can see uh, the guy recording, probably myself, uh, moving the mouse just to demonstrate that you could uh, move it around and increase the rotation speed and stuff. Super! Oh, here's another song. This is a variant of John Carpenter's The End from Escape from New York. <laughs> famous, made even more famous by yeah. uh, the title team to the game Gods on Amiga. Then you, I guess you have to move to the next one because uh, if yeah. there is more than a few seconds of copyrighted music, I will get a warning by YouTube. That <laughs> you are perfectly correct. Uh, let's grab the next one then. It is also a relatively early demo. Uh, so we have one from, from 88, one from 89, and this one is from 1990. It was released in the summer and uh, it was a great thing to watch and especially one part. So because this is a mega demo, uh, I can't show all of it. It's the recording is one hour long, uh, but I can briefly speak about some of the parts and yep. why they affected me back then. So I have a memory of this uh, release and that is watching this together with quite a few months later actually uh, watching this together with my crew at an internal meeting in Arboga outside Stockholm or quite a far away from Stockholm but um, um, and that was nice. It was my first night out with the boys in Phenomena. We had pizzas. We didn't have beer because we weren't old, old enough. <laughs> um, uh, but we had a good time uh, in the internal meeting and uh, we got some stuff done and we watched demos and drank cola and ate chips and pizzas and stuff. But it, I mean, f first of all, Kefrens is, of course, something I've heard of. Uh, Desert Dream, I guess, is sort of, I would say, the most, the, the one I would uh, associate them with. But but it's also interesting to see that you have sort of a menu. So yep. it's, it's not sequentially played. You pick the parts you would like to see. Are, are you getting back to the menu between every part then? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so this obviously requires, if you have a menu or even a loader part, you have to reserve some of uh, the precious chip mem and maybe some of the slow memory as well. Uh, the fast memory variant that is available only on Amiga 500, hmm. um, which means there's less memory available for the individual parts. So hmm. in this loader, you can see a zooming vector, filled vector, uh, text zoomer like this. Uh, which um, gives you credits for the uh, loader, I guess. I don't think it introduces each part. Each part introduces itself. And I remember this one, especially because uh, Firefox came over and we both thought it had really cool music. And uh, we recognized it from somewhere. And it's actually um, 
uh, Axel F um, from um, Beverly Hills Cop. Uh, made by the famous synthesizer musician and an a adaptation for Amiga and, and these are like splits or or what do we see in the background here uh, what you see in the background is a typical um, how do we call it uh, what's a demo a French demo well it's it's basically a copper list full of weights to make mm. these vertical 16 pixel wide uh, columns mm. and then you make some sort of uh, and this turns the copper into a low res mode so the mode will be something like uh, 20 pixels wide and uh, full pixel resolution vertically and in that mode you then you then, you then fill that screen uh, mm -hmm. with um, true color RGB values. So it's a very early chunky effect, you could say. Uh, it's not quite a chunky effect as we mean them now because you don't have total freedom. In order to fill this much data, uh, you sort of use the blitter to copy uh, um, existing uh, copper shades in memory. So if each column were expanded to full screen width, then you would see something like a traditional copper bar or copper shade. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're trying to mix it up by having many of them in chipmem and blitting from them into the copper list. Mm -hmm. uh, in front of them you see uh, a two-dimensional um, thing that looks like um, a transforming plot routine which is kind of interesting you can also see some bugs maybe but that could be uh, the guy recording the video not using the exactly correct uh, kickstart version or or uh, platform settings mm. to record it relatively simple part it's uh, not the main reason for this we have a famous mainstay of 1990, which is the uh, Snurkle Scroller. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know Exelon did a few of those. Yeah, and um, who is the most famous for it with Masma Music, the first Snurkle Scroller? Well, first famous Snurkle... I don't know who made the first Snurkle Scroller, but this is not one of the first. We have some nice animated sprites. But and I mean, it's it's rather big character. So I mean, if you're going to do it, the you still need to have a fast routine if you want to have the characters rather big. The uh, yeah. the smaller you make the characters, the easier it is to actually squeeze it into the uh, the available CPU time. Absolutely. So before and the here I start liking the logos. This is a good one. <laughs> All right. Um. And there's more than one in the same demo. Mm. So oh. this is a sign of this was the same. This was a sign of how busy the groups were then. They had many members, and they sort of skipped school to get more time to be productive for the group. And there was no problem at all for them to make many more logos than the group could release demos. So mm. they probably had a few uh, logos uh, on hand that uh, they could use them. But it looks like it has sort of the same outline, so the, the size is the same, it's just the, uh, the the filling and the shading that would be different between them, wasn't it? So Yeah, you might be right. So it might be a single logo and uh, multiple palettes. palettes. Mm. Um, so the snorkel, snorkel scroller effect, uh, if oh. you don't know it, uh, it consists of pre-rotated uh, characters in Chipmem. Uh, and then you make a curve of some sort. It can be a sine curve, uh, or in this case, a circle. Uh, and uh, you get uh, the rotation values and you look up the correctly rotated character to blit in each point around the circle then. And I take back the fact that the logo was the same because the previous one was totally different. So, All right. Yeah. Sorry about that. That was a stupid comment, seemingly. So. Uh, so let's see if we can yeah, get to... I mean, it, it, it added a lot when it was bouncing. You can see it sort of squeezing against the edges. 
Yeah. Uh, so that uh, squeezing effect would be sort of like clipping, but instead of actually clipping it, you just move it back to the edge of the screen, and then you get this sort of jelly effect. Mm -hmm. So here we have another good programmer. Metallion was a good programmer, and uh, good coder, and uh, so was Promax. And um, Sweden made, meets Denmark. He made arguably the first Glens in this demo. Whether you consider it true Glens or not is up to you, but it's certainly transforming and it's certainly translucent. Uh, so the effect you see here works sort of like. Um, like uh, a Glens ve vector would. Uh, it may look like it's using dual playfield mode, uh, but in fact, uh, it's not using dual playfield mode just in order to get this effect coming up right now. Oh yeah. So this means a couple of things. Um, it means that both sides of the polygons must be drawn at all times, but obviously you couldn't write, uh, draw them into the same bit planes. So you have a mechanic, uh, some sort of method for uh, when uh, a polygon is back facing, you move it back to the backmost uh, play field. I'm mm -hmm. sorry about the air quotes. <laughs> uh, um, so that uh, you sort the object into back-facing and front-facing uh, uh, parts. So as, as the object rotates, it gets uh, divided into two parts, uh, one called the front and one called the back. They are rendered into separate bit planes and the uh, palette is set up to form the translucency. And this is full frame? This is full 50 uh, FPS? No, this is half frame rate. Okay. Um, but uh, it was an early lens effect. Um, uh, the next one would be Animotion by Celebrandil. I'm not totally sure, but I think this one was uh, preceded uh, Celebrandil's uh, lens effect in Animotion. And both of them are half frame rate. Um, uh, is yours? there sort of a reference somewhere where, like, this is the first demo that features this effect? There, there is such a thing on, on CSDB where there is a list of, of stuff where, okay, they were the first to do this and they were the first to do that. Uh, such a thing could be created on, for example, Demo Zoo or Jane Way or uh. something like that. But obviously it takes a bit of contribu uh, contribution and fighting, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody saying, no, you're lying, this was yeah. the first, and that sort of thing. Yeah, there is always debate. Um, apart from perhaps, here we have, um, here we have Alcatraz bars, <laughs> aka Kefren's bars. Yeah, yeah. So Alcatraz was first, this I know, because, uh, well, I knew it to begin with, but you've seen, I'm sure, the corrections of those who lie and say that Kefren's was first. Um, we do call them Kefren's bars on the C64 as well, so it's... Oh. So I think it only has to do with which of the demos you saw first. Mm -hmm. When you The demo where you saw it first, that's what you're going to call them. And they are bars. Um, uh, so, uh, Droopy and Static of Rebels would take this to the extreme later, but it didn't make my top 10 list because of lack of space. But if you right. want to see perhaps the best incarnation of these, uh, there's also uh, uh, the diagonal demo by Razer 1911, uh, which uses ham for the same effect, um, and some other variations. Uh, so what you, you do is uh, you build up a copper list and you make the uh, you blit uh, you blit um, small small slivers of these. If you look at the Kefren's bars, you can sort of see that they consist of two pixel high, thirty two pixel or something wide cylinders that are somewhat shaded, and these are then uh, uh, blitted. Uh, in that size and 
extended by way of the uh, uh, either the blitter or the copper and then you build a copper list um, and for every second line in this case uh, you uh, make a scan so-called scan line effect so that uh, from memory you pick uh, you pick um, a scan line um, that should be represented on that line um, so these uh, two pixel high, 32 pixel wide sort of cylinders are extended virtually infinitely, well, as high as the screen is. Uh, and then you use um, a sign lookup uh, to look up uh, which of this, um, uh, when they are blitted, they are blitted into a back buffer. And this is what causes the uh, sort of snake, the sort of infinite bobs effect. Uh, and then you uh, uh, build up your copper list uh, from from the, these back buffers in memory. Is this something you have on your uh, copper shade as well? Uh, no, I do not have a tutorial on that. Uh, it might yeah. be. Uh, I, I'm might still be of interest. Uh, I'm still looking for time yeah. to um, first of all on my um, so copper shade was started as a. Um, uh, we can have a look at some vector objects, perhaps. Uh, again, from Promax, and this now is full frame rate. This is standard um, uh, convex vectors, but very Three. big and very fast. Yeah. Uh, Copper Shade was started as the front page of my assembly ASM school on YouTube. Uh, and you have plenty of tutorials there and on YouTube. Uh, and I've always been looking for big chunks of time to continue the work on YouTube mm -hmm. and do some more tutorials, especially uh, sharing how to imagine when you, how to break something down into and writing the actual assembler assembly mm -hmm. code rather than, than going by example and modifying the examples. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you write your own stuff? Mm -hmm. And then after that, there might be room uh, for articles on Copper Shade or videos on YouTube on specific effects. Oops. Also some nice music here, but uh, we'll skip from this mega demo now. It will take forever. And I had started playing that. Oh, so uh, I had an issue with my camera, so you would just see my... Uh my face and and uh, but Henrik is Henrik is the key event and the demos are even more important even more important than Henrik here so let's let's just continue and and accept the fact that I'm not sort of mobilely visible all right so this next one is called 3d intro uh, it's from a Finnish group called phalanx and uh, Dakota was a personal hero of mine uh, and again, it's hard to motivate this now, 30, 35 years later. Uh, what, why did you like someone? Why did you like a particular demo? But uh, this is uh, one of the demos that I uh, used to watch for an hour easily. So the demo starts quiet and it's quite dull at the start. Uh, you have to ha give it some, um, some uh, faith. Uh, for what's coming up. It's a sequel to a previous um, uh, intro by Phalanx um, and by the sim author. And it's a reply to his own demo, basically. So in that demo, he writes, the time has come. And in this demo, he writes, the time has gone. So now it's going to be a lot of text here. So he introduces the demo. Uh, he liked, uh, like like I do, he liked to work on his uh, scrollers, mm. uh, not to give them a lot of effects maybe, but uh, to give them expression. So he had a lot of, um, and that's what we added in the last few parts of the demo tutorial on YouTube. Uh, how do you make a scroller stop and twirl like that? Just did. Um, how do you squeeze the characters? How do you basically make the scroll text more interesting to read? And 
my way of doing it. It's not, uh, you can do it any way you want. Uh, but um, often it was um, uh, done by adding uh, commands to the scroller. So mm -hmm. you'd have you'd have some magic codes instead of a, um, a character, and the code would then cause an exception to the normal handling and not plot a character, but mm -hmm. instead perform some sort of command. And it was in the scroll text was in in multiple colors all this time. It's just a palette switch, palette switch. Keep getting caught out by the word word palette. A palette to me is uh, something made out of wood that you put heavy equipment onto, mm -hmm. and a palette is an artist's tool that he holds in his hand and squeezes out oil paint onto. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so, why did I look up to Taipan? Well, um, he was a he was a good coder, and above all, uh, he didn't rush things. He did things properly, and here you see a very high precision uh, 3D routine for the coordinates, as well as the star field. One of the things to note about the star field is that. Um, it fills the entire screen. Uh, other renditions uh, that didn't have as high precision, they didn't fill the entire screen. Uh, they looked, if you look at a star field, you can sort of see the sides of a cube mm. that uh, the stars are traveling within. So by this time in 1990, I learned a thing or two about 3D on Amiga. And this is why I could appreciate uh, the precision here. Mm. Uh, we will also see uh, this is 1990, so it was just around the time when people were starting to fill the polygons. Uh, and in this case, uh, we'll see some hidden lines, uh, which means that uh, his 3D routine doesn't only convert uh, coordinates and draw lines between them. But it also has a concept of surfaces and knows uh, which surfaces cover others. Um, and then you have a choice. You either fill in uh, the covering polygon with black, which is cheating, or you uh, do clipping on, uh, on the uh, lines that are hidden. And this is uh, not as common, it's not very common at all. Uh, and not many demos on Amiga have correct, uh, correctly clipped uh, hidden lines. Mm. So this is perhaps the most technical of the demos that I have on my list for tonight. Um, and because of its age, maybe you think this is nothing special, it's just an object show on a static screen but details like that when the mm. ship flies away you can see the precision as it goes away you don't just have a division table that's uh, that limits the depth of uh, the 3d world so a routine like this could be used for example for a uh, game engine mm. stuff like that it's general it's it's not uh a lot of pre preparatory work so it will work in certain aspects in the demo and you would ensure that you make sort of when you make it visible uh, you avoid any shortcomings of your routines you just show where it looks nice but you can't have that in games then you need to have a general thing which works for yeah. all cases uh, something like that it's not a special purpose uh, effect uh, and obviously from this demo with this engine, you could then special case it and uh, and uh, get your uh, records and mm. keep the records and stuff. And the song is uh, an excellent one by uh, Walkman, Crypto Burners. Quite chill one. Um, it has plenty of more vector objects, but I'd like to move on to the next demo. Yeah, where are we now? Are we number uh, five? Uh, I lost count already. <laughs> I know when the demo ends because we will have a very recent demo at the end. Oh, okay. So I've counted them beforehand. 
Uh, here we have another unfilled vector demo. And why do you say I, I should appear online as a big, big fan of filled vectors, especially so-called in convex filled vectors? Um, um, uh, but um, there were a lot of them, and I'm probably partially responsible, I hear, <laughs> from the deluge of uh, Glenn's vector demos on Amiga. There were a lot of those. Um, um, so I skipped uh, on most of the fill vectors. We will have a demo soon with fill vectors, but here's another line vector that has another thing going for it. So now you're about to puke, right? Because look at this frame rate. What crap demo is this? And the, dem and the vectors aren't even, even filled. Well, I'll be quiet and see if you notice something. So the first impression is that this is not exactly scripted. There's a script somewhere, of course, because the demo will play sort of the same way every time you run it and every time it loops, but it will be slightly different. Um, <clears throat> uh, he has gone for the more complicated calculations in this demo. So this is a demo by Tristui, uh, Tristan Lorach, um, probably butchering that name. He's a French coder, um, and at the time he did this, I didn't know this then, but at the time he did this, he was at university. So he had access to courses and uh, literature to teach him all about um, uh, linear al algebra. Uh, but even so, he, w he was uh, on the cutting edge here. This demo is from 1991. And there weren't a whole lot of 3D software like Lightwave and uh, Real 3D and stuff that could actually um, uh, let you do uh, tween animation on 3D objects. Mm. Um, I'm probably lying at this point. I'm trying to exaggerate it to show that this is rather unique in the demo world. Mm. Uh, first of all, you have a camera. Uh, not many 3D demos to date have an actual camera in them. Um, and it differs from a normal 3D routine in that instead of rotating uh, the ca a camera, a normal 3D routine would uh, rotate. Let's see, let me, it's late at night. Let me uh, phrase this correctly. It rotates the objects within the world, sort of, mm -hmm. as best I can uh, explain it. Uh, whereas this uh, camera uh, exists in the world and is pointed at some other part of the world. Mm -hmm. And this animation right here, just, just creating that animation uh, in with all the tools in the world, all the modern tools in the world, you ask a 3D animator to do somebody making a, an Aikido Jiu-Jitsu fall, mm. like he did, a martial arts fall, and have all the joints follow and not get gimbal locked and all that stuff. Mm. Um, maybe there was some, maybe he did fix some, some things that went wrong in the animation, but it's still a very, very early and strong showing from somebody who was at university and decided that instead of going for fast routines, I'll go for a slow routine that is much more advanced than mm. most of the 3D you see on Amiga. Massive. Cool. 
So there are quite a few objects. Uh, we have uh, we have a dog and a dolphin. You can see if we have this uh, knight that transforms into another guy. We have a robot. And meanwhile, the birds, the bird or birds, are doing their thing and following mm -hmm. some point in the sky uh, and going towards that point. Here's a little doggy. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a Dawsund. Yeah, a visiting Fjelldot, I just saw a, a little dog that wasn't too unlike that one. And that was on, on VCS 2600, so the uh, the old uh, Atari. Oh yeah, uh, Mer Mer I saw that too. Uh, Mermaid had made yes. some great animations on that yes, dog. With... Yes, that was Banya. Yes, correct. Yes. So... This is pretty cool. Uh, so uh, even though you don't see the legs, he has to calculate the joints in the legs mm -hmm. to place uh, the feet in the right position and with the right angle. So you can see his paw when he lifts it, it changes changes angle like that. Mm -hmm. That means that even though he doesn't draw the lines for the legs, he has to follow the joints to know where the corner of the paw is, so to speak. And he also has some floppiness to, to the ears. Great, uh, Hendrik. I mean, if if you hadn't been here hosting this, uh, it would have been, oh, yeah, yeah, this is a uh, lame vector. It's really <laughs> slow. And uh, if you don't understand the complexity, you might not in uh, appreciate it to the full relevant extent. Yeah. So this is uh, one of the demos I selected for my demo show on Datastorm one year. Mm -hmm. And so it was it was good to give it a showing on the big screen, but it did compete and it won. Um, and uh, the video description should say, because I recorded this, should say uh, which party it won. So there's a hand and there's a dolphin. Winner of the Cyclone Party in 1991. Looks out deceiving. I said I, I should correct that. He probably was 20 something when he did this because he was at university. So seeing it that way, he had a couple of years. Uh, uh, he was a couple of years ahead of us in time and knew more uh, in order to do this. But it's still uh, still nice that he released this. If he hadn't, we wouldn't have had uh, jointed 3D graphics on uh, jointed 3D animations on, on Amiga. Tristan Lorach. Great. Oh, this demo I've seen. And I don't know why it's recorded uh, on Kickstart 3.0. Um, it's the best video I could find. Um, and we return to Taipan, the previous uh, line vector, hidden, hidden line vector coder. And he later joined another Finnish group called Complex. And he made what many think, and I'm included, uh, among those, one of the finest uh, field vector in convex 3D routines on Amiga. Let's see if we can skip ahead a little. Yeah, that was just no, description, it's so it's not part of the actual video. Yep. And for those of you who know your musicians, the, mu uh, the music is made by Joger uh, Joger. <laughs> <laughs> Lily Doll, aka uh, Jugi. So you may think that it's kind of choppy, but it's actually very, very fast for three in convex objects on the screen at the same time. And then the magic moment from and the first Star Wars movie when they attack the Death Star and the X-Wings show their true nature. <laughs> so cool. I agree. And the TIE Fighter. We have two normal ones and one that is the Interceptor TIE Fighter owned by Darth Vader. Oh, Space Collision. Yeah. So 
you can see that this is real time because the more of the objects that come on screen, the slower the routine runs. Mm. And the bigger they are, the slower it runs. But this mm. is still extremely fast for so many polygons and relatively many colors. Uh, and the filling is accurate. Uh, mostly accurate. Accurate. I see some glitches in, in, the, in the joints between polygons. <laughs> and here's uh, Taipan's um, upset comment at all the plane cut demos. <laughs> That's how you do plane cut. <laughs> so, a rather complex 3D object that is animated. A bit limited animation, you see. Um, the joints on the ATAT is it? ATST. Uh, the Imperial Walker thing, or yeah, yeah. No? Previously, uh, is not as advanced as uh, Tristan Lorach's uh, uh, line vector uh, animations, but you still have several degrees of freedom in the animation, and it's a fantasy object. Maybe it's a reference to the hunt for Red October. Uh, codes were competitive then, and you would often reply with um, by making a demo about it. Mm. <laughs> and then we have uh, Jugi's little joke at the end of the joke. <laughs> and then it starts over. Um, so that's a technically a technical achievement that I did want on my list. Cool. And then we have a star field with many, many stars. And an ad scroller. So now we are in for a classic. And yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I is... know this one. <laughs> this should be recognizable by Amiga fans worldwide. Uh, it is the famous demo from uh, 1992. And by Cryonics and the Silence, it's called Hardwired, and I let it speak for itself. Much less math in this one. Well, just you wait. <laughs> yeah, 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 but so far. So the impressive part about the introduction, which is preceded by loading an entire disk into memory, uh, is sort of the overall production. Uh, so uh, Jesper Kid and uh, Bala, they were Mikkel. working. Mikkel Bala were working together on rendering, 3D rendering, and especially rendering to VHS. You've probably seen the classic CG tapes that went around in those days, and they were responsible for a couple of them. Um... Yeah, Global Trash is, uh, that's that's them as well, right? Um, yep. That one was shown on uh, TCC in 93 in Gothenburg, right? So it's uh, that's still, I mean, it's not Amiga, but it's still one of the most impressive pieces of art I've seen. Yeah, this uh, is math. This is for sure math. There's some math here for sure. Uh, and it, it will progress. Uh, this demo was once uh, also the cutting edge of uh, demo releases on Amiga, and especially. Uh, the overall s impression that the production makes. Just like um, I will mention a group by uh, a demo by Scoopex. Uh, we'll get to it uh, maybe in the last uh, interview mm. episode, but uh, just like Mental Hangover changed things a little bit um, uh, by being the first uh, track loaded uh, demo and by being long and sort of mm. connected but not having a shared theme or being directed or having a set script or something like that. This was much more like uh, what uh, track modes or track loaded demos 
mm-hmm. were going to become. So it was the first of many, and it's inspired many to do uh, long demos with a coherent style and impressive effects. So there was some more math. Uh, you had a uh, B spline, I think. Um, and here's uh, some output from uh, uh, Mikael Balle. Uh, Ray traced shit. Oh. <laughs> um, so they were into 3D rendering uh, um, uh, quite a bit, and some of it made it to Amiga demos. I think they were working in uh, some sort of a local TV station, and uh, so they had access to, uh, I mean... Beefy, beefy computers yeah, that could well, quickly. S- stuff not really achievable or reachable for, uh, for the average people. Or at least for teenagers. Mm. Uh, you, so... you always tend to have soft spots. I, I seriously like those rubbery things. Yeah, yeah. So this is a a twister, uh, lightly done in sprites on top of a uh, probably 16 color background, and it's a very iconic scene, uh, having that metal metal uh, s- sculpture dude behind the twister, mm-hmm. and also having the twister being sort of me- metallic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is also cool. Kind of salting the logo. Yeah. Well, the impressive part here is that you have this uh, cube that rotates in the same pattern all the time, and by doing that, you can have a uh, cyclical buffer. So you can have many, many buffers of this front face on the cube, and remove pixel from it gradually. And that's how that is done. And then the rest is a traditional uh, plot transform. This is and music a, here a more, well. yeah, music. and this is a, a a more developed plot transform uh, where uh, the shadows uh, come from the back buffers, back buffers of the rotated objects, and they are overlaid on top of another to be sort of translucent and be sort of shade bobby, if you will, it reminds of a shade bob uh, effect. Um, and a note to my viewers, uh, this was not prepared. Uh, I may talk out of my arse on some of these parts. I know I made a mistake on the Kefren's bars, but I corrected myself at the end. Um, and besides, I haven't looked at the code for any demo, uh, so it is just my perception anyway, my perception and my oh. projection. This is how I perceive it to have been done. It's one way of doing it, you could say. If I were to implement such an effect, this would be one of the possible ways to do it. So here we have something similar to the snorkel scroll that we saw before, Mm -hmm. but instead of um, uh, colliding with the edges of the screen and moving uh, the ball uh, or the character, I should say, of the snorkel scroller back into the screen, it moves, uh, it keeps track of, uh, it, it creates a virtual ditch uh, formed by those two surfaces there uh, and uh, in 3D coordinates and uh, when the balls uh, uh, collide with that uh, surface it looks as if it collides with the surface that you see on the screen. And then the humor by erasing it like manually. Yeah. A nice touch. A really nice touch. Uh, I can think of a few more codes that had n- a nice touch like that. That would be maybe something like Metallion used to do. Some uh, Put some uh, bit of extra TLC uh, into his parts. So here we have the classic Jelly Cube. Mm. So to do this, uh, I don't know if he used uh, some of his uh, spline formulas. Uh, what you do is uh, this was shared in uh, this is shared in a uh, an Amiga Future article that I wrote. Uh, and what you do is you create a method for uh, easing curves. 
um, so you would use something like a traditional transform calculation and make it follow uh, a curve uh, for the corner uh, coordinates for the jelly cube and uh, by creating the curve in real time or not as you as you choose uh, you can then affect the projection of each corner of the cube to make it look jelly-like and follow this animated bouncy curve. And then you had the, the, the previous one was sort of a light and then uh, all the shadow casting was done fully correctly and it was moving around and uh, yeah. Again, I had very little math in school, but uh, that's well beyond me. Yeah, it's relatively easy to do. Uh, it's sort of like uh, blank vectors plus plus, and that is uh, sort of uh, as if you were doing light sourced vectors, filled vectors, uh, but uh, you uh, uh, sort of draw a line from the light to uh, the covering object and then project that line onto the cube. And if it misses, you have to clip you have to then form a polygon that sort of um, lies around the cube like a blanket and then you have to make that polygon uh, not get glitches by losing a corner outside of the cube that's projected upon and then you draw uh, that polygon as a shadow on top of the cube okay well you make it sound so easy so <laughs> <laughs> What I'm trying to do also is uh, trying to explain how it's done in yeah. 20 seconds or so. So yeah, yeah then... that's that's absolutely fine. And uh, mm -hmm. you're also talking to somebody who is uh, whose math level is is not uh, able to kind of comprehend it anyway. So yeah, all my explanations here will be uh, somewhat simplified. It's more conceptual than anything else. So I like this part because it has a very haunting music. It's got some cool, I wouldn't say this is manga, but at the time manga was uh, popular. And this is something in the same style that you had uh, sort of black and white uh, comics. And with the haunting music and following the ship into the port, you could, you could dream and get into the demo and get a vibe from the demo. Here's another problem that they solved, namely, how do you take a screenshot of an effect because you can't just press print, print screen and there were no emulators back then. Uh, so they would have had to have some way of getting the frame out and converting it. Maybe uh, Mikael Balle had uh, some way of doing that at the radio station, uh, some sort of capture device, or else they would have to prepare each effect and make it render to a smaller screenshot which is a lot of work. Yeah, this is all very slick. Yep. And fully deserved to play, be played to the end. Now we're moving forward in time. Uh, this is, uh, a, this is, um, I've only shown one 40K intro because one of the excellent things about um, uh, the Amiga demo scene is the 40K intro era. And that lasted from, I would say, 90, 91, 92 until 97, 98, uh, 1998, something like that. And here you see a Chaos Sumer. Uh, and uh, you uh, create such an effect by making a grid on the screen consisting of uh, many smaller blitz, uh, maybe 32 by 24 pixels. And then you create um, an array of um, zooming arrows out from the center. And by then processing each tile from the back buffer uh, to the front buffer, you move them all uh, in a spiral and outwards from the center. That's a traditional mandel brought. Uh, yeah, the mantle brought here is uh, just the start image they use for the Chaos Sumer. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not the first Chaos Sumer. I believe the first example of the effect, there were some scrollers uh, previously by The Silence. 
uh, in Tropical Sunset and uh, in a few other demos that reminded of this effect. It is a, a sort of a blitter transform between uh, the front and the back buffers. Um, and that is also 40k intro, but unfortunately there was no uh, correct uh, YouTube capture of that demo. And that is, uh, uh, I forget the title, but it's um, by The Shining. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it has, it, it is, it, I think it's recognized as having the first chaos sumer type effect and actually explores it more fully. Whereas, um, banana man by stellar that we just saw is a fully mature and nice and correct and, and, uh, glitch free version of the chaos sumer. There were many variants and that was one of the ultimate ones. In my opinion, that's why it's featured here. And Stellar also had good coders, and they just threw in <laughs> an animated uh, 3D character jumping across the screen uh, as a as a part of a 40k intro because probably they had it laying around just ready for use, which is uh, kind of cool. So here we have another mm, demo. Uh, on Amiga OCS. Uh, it's a good tester of your Amiga 500. If this demo fails, uh, there is something wrong with your Amiga 500. It's sort of a benchmark demo, if you will, just like the last demo that's coming up after this one. Excellent graphics, crazy graphics by RAW. Here's a sort of a scanline effect, like a road in Lotus Turbo Esprit, uh, but, but with some extras and uh, lots and lots of uh, uh, palette shading. So it's not actual texture mapping, but if you restrict yourself to having a texture on a road, you can do that. Mm. And I'll have trouble explaining all the effects because uh, this is a, a, a blitter uh, scaler and it works because uh, only one of the two objects are very large at once. Uh, here's a similar effect in, uh, well, it's sort of a uh, blitter mapper uh, in one bit plane in a lower resolution. So this is uh, close to one of the holy grails on Amiga, namely uh, a blitter chunky. Uh, so it's sort of a blitter chunky, but uh, transformed to bend around um, a sphere and then drawn in one bit then on top of this sphere. And that is a star field. <laughs> yes. With many, many stars. And, and if you compare that to the first star field in the first, the thorax one, this is quite different. Yeah, this is a sort of a plot record, you could say. Uh, it's quite easy to mimic something like this if you know what you're doing. But you can also see sort of what I talked about before. You could sort of make out the sides of the cube, which means uh, they have a more limited lookup table for uh, transforming Mm. doing the three three well the divisions basically so it's moving it's it's not moving infinite infinitely within the the uh, the world it's it's setting its limits to somewhere and then it, the tables are sort of supporting only that yeah and the tables also means that uh, you don't have to use a, a division instruction not even a multiplied instruction uh, but you can project uh, the uh, 3D anyway. It's it's just a movement in X, Y, Z. You just add to the X, Y, Z coordinates and then you have a table, big table for the division construction. Uh, and that was a zoom rot with slime. Very early example of that. You Here's... basically take a picture and then you copy it to somewhere else, but you manipulate it in the process. I'm sorry, what was that? 
you you take the original picture and then you have you copy it to the destination, but you are making a transformation in the process. I I guess. Uh, well, I don't think I have time to explain uh, ah, okay. um, uh, a chunky... Then my movie. explanation was probably totally wrong, <laughs> so forget that one. So here's another plot record that also uses tables. Um, you could see this in quite a few demos uh, uh, before this one. Uh, this one is different because it, has, it moves uh, uh, coordinates through other coordinates. It can't rotate freely around the y-axis, but nevertheless, this is much more interesting. This is uh, uh, sort of like a chunky mode. I saw an effect like this recently, but this is, I think this is the first example of it. It is a sort of plasma effect, yes, but it is a repeated vertical and horizontal uh, pattern. And the trick is making the horizontal and vertical melt together like that. Here you have something like uh, the famous uh, uh, colored big balls by uh, Lemon and Company. I hope I didn't give credit to the second group that did it. Uh, and here we have a revisit to the glitter uh, um, uh, uh, sort of chunky uh, mode but projected onto a sphere and everything about this demo it's presented in a rapid tempo it's never boring it's very slick mm. and all the parts are high quality high high quality encoding so I, here you see an actual chunky mode it's not very wide uh, but it is uh, 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 higher resolution than 4x4 um, and there is some sort of a zoom rod going on, uh, but perhaps not actually projecting a texture onto onto the screen coordinate. Here we have an effect like in Thunderblade on C64, <laughs> high pipe, and it's very nicely done. Um, how do I explain this effect? You're walking around in a stack of uh, sticky notes. I don't think I have time to explain it. And I th don't think, I think of all the effects, that's the more niche one, and which could have been done in several ways. It could have been done with filling, it could have been done as a scanline effect, um, sort of like uh, Kefren's bars and stuff like that. So the trick is removing. Uh, parts of the sides of the towers to get the perspective effect of the towers. Uh, that, by the way, was a chaos zoomer of sorts. And here we have a real-time uh, anti-aliasing routine, it would seem like. And also really good music. I should, I should have, uh, yeah, very slick. And I should have prepared more, I realize now. If I'm going to show this, uh, I better do a special on it uh, because there's so much going on in such a rapid, rapid tempo. And here is one of the absolutely best and fastest um, uh, in convex filled vector routines that have graced Amigos, yes. Done completely with the CPU. Um, uh, at least everything. The ground could have been done with the blitter. Uh, that would be a choice that I would make. Uh, uh, but all the rest is done with the CPU and very, very optimized indeed. Uh, to achieve this, they had to have this screen 256 by 256. Just look at all these objects. The, the sort routine wow. alone. Uh, the sort routine alone is... Um, is uh, uh, um, a, a, a novel uh, algorithm. And you need to sort in order to ensure that the correct objects are covered well, because they are underneath. Or the trick with uh, in convex uh, vectors, if you have many objects, is that the closer you get to full frame rate, uh, like I did in my intro for the crack for where time stood still. The closer you get to full frame rate, the less time, the, 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 the larger percentage 
of the frame rate is occupied by the sort routine. Mm. So you need, uh, uh, and there are obvious ways to do it. Uh, uh, the simplest way would be to have the coordinates move incrementally between frames and only care about the coordinates that uh, change position in, uh, in Z, in Z. And you can see that there's quite a variation in scenes and objects and you can even move your mouse and shoot. You can fly around this thing and shoot at objects and it's still the same frame rate. So very good, if not fully real time, very close to real time demonstration of uh, state of the art field vectors on Amiga. No, no, state, state of the art, that's space balls. Well, pun intended. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're coming up on, so this is sort of a benchmark demo. You can put a modern accelerator in your Amiga 500 or any Amiga that you own, run this part, and uh, maybe it will have trouble with some accelerators, but uh, the end part is definitely worth it to see some very smooth uh, field vectors on Amiga. And here's a recent demo. I had to skip a lot. I had to skip all but one of the 40k intro era. I had to skip a lot of the uh, recent demos uh, because of wanting to share why the early demos th that influenced me were important. Um, and then I basically ran out of space. So uh, what you see now is uh, a combination of Glens and blank vectors in full frame rate. Uh, was it hologon hologon uh, and we can watch until the end and then i can explain what i think a hologon is so this is sort of a two by two not full rgb color uh, but something like seven uh, seven or fifteen color uh, chunky. Uh, here we see uh, uh, a field vector with reflection and transparency, and it carries the hallmark of Bifat's uh, demos for the Electronic Knights, namely uh, very high precision stencil vectors. So you can do an effect like environment mapping by applying uh, cl cleverly. Uh, stencil stencils of the reflected environment in the polygons. To do that, you have to track the reflection, where the reflection is coming from. Uh, that sort of traced ray onto the big uh, stencil uh, then hits a coordinate within that texture and moves the stencil in place into each polygon. And this is also the case here. Uh, so this is a variant of it. Uh, the only difference is that he has many different shades of the same texture. And the ob object also transformed, didn't it? So it wasn't the same from the start to the finish. Exactly. And then you need to know, then you need to uh, uh, calculate the normal the new normal from the transformed surface to the texture that you're stenciling out in each polygon. And just stenciling out the polygons is an achievement to fit in the full frame rate. So here's another staple uh, that Bifat has been working on that you saw in the previous part. Sort of shade bobs, a different take on it. Wow. Here you have something like, it looks like an infinite ray tracing of a, an infinite world, something like that. Um, and it would take too long to explain this effect, and I'm not sure I can do it. I haven't thought much about it because it's such a recent demo. Well, it looks it. really nice. I, I haven't watched it enough. I've only watched it like 50 times. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so here we have uh, another one. Uh, a tunnel effect, uh, which you can do uh, uh, as part of a chunky mode. Uh, here we have a not uh, full resolution a variation of blank and stencil vectors. Uh, so in this case, uh, we don't see the environment reflected uh, in each side of the cube. 
um, but instead we have individual textures and even as you could see there uh, sort of two overlaid textures being uh, blitted onto the surfaces what am i talking about this is texture mapping uh, forget everything i said uh, this is uh, chunky mode texture mapping with back buffer shade bobs, which you're watching right now, and it's very impressive. Uh, when you would see this on a real Amiga, a real CRT, there would be some flickering there, but because of the natural flickering of the CRT in some of these the parts in this demo, like in this one, uh, the flickering w wouldn't appear as bad as it does when replayed on YouTube, for example. Mm. And this is most impressive. You have a donut again with uh, environment mapping. And I don't know if it's uh, uh, texture mapping being used here. It looks too good to be the previous, the previously mentioned uh, stencil vectors for this one. And also the resolution is lower so that he has more time for uh, all the calculations needed. Also, when I talk about these parts here, I'm, I'm looking at the demo and sort of not interacting with the camera because I'm sort of in my own head analyzing what I see. Yeah. Uh, by all means, just watch this demo and enjoy it. Any demo, technically advanced or not, uh, do enjoy it for the show on offer and uh, how it affects your feelings and how it impresses you with design and music and not only technical achievements. So here we have uh, texture mapping, a little bit broken textures, but definitely not as broken as some. I would say that this is close to a lewd quality texture mapping, um, which obviously barely runs at decent frame rate on mm. an Amiga uh, 1200 with uh, a 60 or 60 CPU. So just being able to do this in anywhere near uh, 10 FPS or uh, 12 FPS is uh, a great application of a lot of work. A lot of work and testing and optimization and finding ways to beat the impossible because that part is impossible <laughs> on OCS and yet we see it. And that yeah. is the logo reflecting the the environment around it. Yeah. So this is done like one of the first few parts. Mm. Where I talked about stencil vectors and environment mapping. So it's not full resolution, so it's not correct uh, environment mapping, but the donut that you saw in lower resolution, uh, uh, that used a different method might not be real-time um, ray tracing <laughs> because that is definitely impossible but uh, something like it by optimizing the formulas eliminating everything that doesn't need to be calculated and setting up your screen mode your screen size um, uh, making a great uh, sort routine and all that stuff together uh, builds up a single part in this demo most of the, these parts in this demo requires an engine. The Electronic Knights. I, I noticed Krill because he's a guy that works on the 64 as well. He's, uh, he does a lot of things, but he's mostly known for his loaders on the C64. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I do believe that Bifat, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that Bifat has written his own track loader. Um, and in doing so, he can also optimize, he can load parts while having an effect that takes 95, 98% of the available raster time. Um, so what you would do the, then is do, you would limit the amount of data loaded each frame. The loading would then go slower but you could have an effect ongoing instead of having a text screen as was common in, in the track, in the older track loaded demos. Mm. 
So that is my list of the 10 top 10 Amiga OCS demos and I'm I'm very sorry that I had to skip so many worthy. Yeah, yeah for sure. I mentioned but uh I'm I'm even more sorry that my my video camera <laughs> crashed in the middle of this so you would see a still of me and uh but let's just keep that as a background. I I do have a few like additional questions before we wrap up. First of all, all right. you, you you mentioned chunky mode a number of times. Could you take us through what is that? Uh, a chunky mode comes, uh, as far as we know, well, it comes in at least two known flavors, uh, blitter chunky and copper chunky. Um, and actually three variants. If you have a fast enough accelerator, you can do a CPU chunky. So the demos you see on AGA and 68040 or higher, they typically have, that's when the CPU is so fast, it beats any attempt, any other attempt at, uh, the blitter is so slow in comparison, you can't, you can't use mm -hmm. it. Maybe not even on 68030. 68020, the jury is still out. Maybe you could use the blitter for part of the transformation. And uh, what you want ideally, uh, let's take let's take the ideal case. Uh, no screen mode on Amiga has a full resolution uh, true color mode. The closest thing you can get is the Ham 8 mode on HEA. Uh, on OCS, this uh, corresponds to the Ham 6 mode, which uh, instead of a uh, possible uh, 16 million plus colors. Uh, has up to 4,096 colors and actually up to something like 15,000 colors, a little over 15,000 colors if you uh, interlay, use interlace or flicker the screen, flicker the RGB values. Now that's the ideal case. Problem is ham mode is inherently difficult to render into. Mm -hmm. If you were to draw a line with a blitter into it, the line would be a mess first of all and you'd have to uh, on on the let's see right side of the line you would have to draw black pixels to stop the line stop the knees from holding that pixel until the right edge of the screen if my camera is mirrored now you will see me pointing to the wrong edge but <laughs> um that's how ham mode works. It holds the color and modifies it slightly. Yeah, that's hold and modify. That's what it is. So yeah, and that means you get fringes, and many attempts have been made to make a ham uh, chunky mode, and that is actually a variant of copper chunky. So you'd use uh, ham mode with an illegal uh, setting of seven bit planes, which is not possible on OCS. Instead, the hardware decides that you, to use five bit planes and to repeat the fifth bit plane as a 16 pixel wide, one bit plane uh, deep pattern across the screen. So you can see this in some chunky demos for OCS uh, from, I would say, 2004 until 2008, 9, 10. And uh, one coder who, ex who excelled at those is Bright Light of Decadence. And a recent uh, demo using it is uh, What Am I Greybeard uh, by Blueberry Blueness. Um, so by basically by uh, finding a ham mode that doesn't give fringes mm. uh, and maybe use the pattern or not, but and that would then give you the possibility of, of at least um, having a chunky, that is to say, a lower resolution screen mode, but you'd get uh, true color, a true color mode that is lower res than 320 by 256. Right. Well, I mean, f for, for me, from the C64 side, for me, chunky would be that you sort of artificially lower the resolution by having like four times four pixel pixels, and then you would need to update fewer pixels. Exactly. So it, it would be some uh, like a, a method to have graphics with lower resolution that still runs a lot faster than if you do it with like the full resolution. Yeah, there's a classic. Um, I think there's a classic Glenn's Vector uh, C64 demo from 1993, four um, that uses a four by four character mode 
to be able to render uh, glance vectors um, into it without the frame rate dropping to a crawl. Uh, but... and, this, and the same is true for Amiga. Uh, it's all about bandwidth. Uh, so the fewer pixels you have to uh, change on the screen, mm. the more you can do with them. And the more colors you have on the screen, the more data you have to move so that you need more bandwidth. Mm. So the, the goal is to make a chunky mode with a very low bandwidth, uh, ideally using the copper, as I said, to offload the CPU and blitter so that you can use the CPU and blitter, CPU or blitter to fill fill that screen mode buffer. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I update, updating stuff that's not visible. Uh, if you have it like a standard routine, um, painting a cube or whatever, not every part of the cube is actually visible. But but if you are going to make parts of it not visible and and uh, detecting that that detection also takes CPU, so there is always the the balance of what you should do there, I guess. Uh, yes, although I would say uh, hiding back facing polygons saves a lot of time. If you're oh. doing a, just a solid object, you're going to save almost half the time of rendering by uh, doing some culling before you render. So looking at a few of the newer ones and, and especially the really old ones, what has evolved like the most? Why is it possible to do more? Is it the uh, the faster routines and, and building like implementing proper math in faster algorithms or is it loop unrolling or why why is it so much nicer now than it was back in the days? I think uh, a large part of why this demo that we just watch is nicer is because there's a lot of thought to design mm. and that the design fits the parts and that mm. the parts fit together. Uh, I think the C64 scene excels at that. Uh, they seem to almost always uh, succeed in producing uh, the big groups, uh, in producing uh, a demo that can be several minutes long, but still keeps interest. All, in, all the way until the end. Uh, so that's one, uh, and sometimes also, this is not a, a case of that. Here's Here there's uh, only one coder, I believe. Uh, maybe another coder did some of the coding here, but I think this is by Fat's uh, code alone, uh, one-man coder demo. If you have big groups uh, with many coders, of course, you can do bigger and more impressive uh, shows demos longer demos and each coder can then be a specialist in their own thing and maybe uh, there was it was two years since they last did a twister for example and mm. he's really good he's learned more now he's optimized some more he's found uh, a neat algorithm or invented one to improve it or he's found a special case uh, or he's found a way of uh, rendering it that looks better than the one from two years ago. So then presented as a part in a bigger demo, you get an update of that effect. And by adapting the graphics that you render, you can you can theme your demo. Mm. Uh, most famous theme on C64, I think, is uh, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, one of them, at least. Another is uh, Thriller in, in Helsing Boy. Mm. <laughs> mm. Uh, the thriller effect uh, and some other th uh, themes like that. On Amiga, we got a Batman theme going on right now, and also some Alice in Wonderland uh, on Amiga OCS. Um, um, so, why are newer demos nicer? I think uh, everyone involved learns more as they as they go. They learn to make more engaging music, uh, new styles of music. Um, uh, new styles of graphics they learn about composition and design and everything that I'm, I'm I wouldn't say I'm bad at it I just haven't demonstrated my true powers yet <laughs> um, but but what about the, the, the math I, I'm again this is again my my view of it and I'm not really sure if it's true because I don't have any substantial uh, data that proves it but but for me, back in the end of the 80s, a number of people were teenagers or in their early 20s. And, and the math skill was basically 
rather rudimentary and now most of the people are in their late 40s or early 50s and uh, and they have been working with math and they understand it more and, and know more so they can implement it better my my math teacher uh, at university uh, who was brilliant and rather young to be a professor or i think he was working on his doctorate um or his professorship or whatever it's called in Swedish. Um, he said that math is not her hard to learn. It's just something you have to get used to. So if you spend enough time playing around with it, you will understand it much better than mm -hmm. otherwise. I, mm -hmm. I touched on this a uh, little bit before. For example, uh, Mikael Balle might have been a few years older than the rest of us mm. at the time of the release of uh, Hardwired. And that's why he had access to a professional studio, which could maybe do those uh, screen captures that we saw at the end of the demo mm. uh, and also make more advanced ray tracing uh, renders than, than was available if you just used an Amiga 500 and used Real 3D, for example. Mm or Vista Pro or any of the software suites that uh, went around the scene at the time. So then it would look more professional, it would look more uh, advanced and more mature. And likewise for the uh, natural movement demo by uh, Tristan Loire. Uh, he was in university then, so he was an old hand perhaps with uh, uh, linear algebra and uh, he could juggle mat matrices in his head and uh, um, transforms were meant nothing to him and he he could apply all that he learned at the university and he chose to apply it to an amiga demo which was awesome yeah maybe also that's uh, the only computer he had at home so uh, at the university he had access to uh, uh, pcs and uh, and um, Sun Unix systems, perhaps, mm. uh, with high level languages and all the math li libraries in the world. Um, and, uh, and yet he, 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 he wanted to downsize that to a seven megahertz processor and, uh, and uh, no advanced built in matrix transforms in libraries and stuff like that. Henrik, we've had uh, technical challenges this time, so normally you would uh, sort of leave this end screen and we would have <laughs> a screen where you are bigger and, and I will also be visible, but we, we didn't have that. So uh, uh, thank you so much for, for this, Henrik. It's been absolutely great. Uh, I guess we should have a list of the demos and, uh, and list them uh, in the description here as well so that everybody can kind of watch them and watch them to the full because we've only seen samples of a few of them. Yeah, uh, it wouldn't be possible. There was one I, I saw that was like an hour if you want. To, yeah, if you watched all of it and, and yeah. we couldn't squeeze that in. It was better to see samples of more so we could have uh, like a, a reasonable run rate here. Yeah. Thank you so much for your contribution and thank you so much for what you're doing for the Amiga scene. It's, it's Amiga. absolutely <laughs> in, <laughs> invaluable. Thank and, you. Uh, and we will have another episode where we will be looking at uh, AGA demos and then we will deep dive into your career in a third episode. So, Henrik, thank you so much for, for your work and uh, see you next time. See you next time. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye, -bye.